We give you all. Father, we just feel this environment, God, with the presence of God. We drive out the day. We drive out the pressures of life. We drive out every weight, every barrier, every resistance, God. We thank you, God, for the glory of God being filled, God. Oh, God, in this room, God, on tonight, God. Father, saturate this environment, God, with your glory, God, and with your power. And we give you the praise, the glory, and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Tonight, we're continuing our teaching on living in the supernatural. This is part five. For the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about the unity of the mind, the unity of the mind. Um, last time we were together, we talked about the setting our minds on him, setting our minds on things above then we talked about 3 John 2, about us prospering and being in health even as our soul prosper. And then we talked about 1 Thessalonians 5.23, that your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless, blameless until the day of Jesus Christ. Then we went over to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, talking about how the word of God is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart and is able to separate your soul from your spirit. And so we discussed that when a person is, is full of the word, then that word that is on the inside of that person gives them the ability to discern uh, what the will of God is, to discern what is going on in other people. Amen? Amen. And so tonight, let's continue to talk about, we got two more um, scriptures up under the, the mind part. So let's uh, continue to talk about this this mind. So go over to James chapter one. James chapter one and drop down to the seventh verse. And we're gonna be reading from the New King James. This um this sub up here is is making a sound. You may want to turn the sub down so it's it's kind of I believe it's the sub. Are you in James chapter 1? Amen. Verse 7 says, For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in some of his way. So this is, this is talking about a person asking in faith and not doubting, right? Um, and it says that, we can do that, but if that person is a double-minded man, he is unstable in all of his ways. When you find somebody operating in a double mind, they, they're unstable in all their ways. That, there's nothing in their life that is right or consistent. And so he says that that person that is double-minded shouldn't think that they're going to receive anything from the Lord. So he's talking to the church here. So ask in faith, not doubting. Matter of fact, let's just go up to verse 5. It says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally, right? Yes. And without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith. Ask how? In faith, in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like the waves of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. That, that double-minded literally means to have a split mind or two minds. Part of your mind is trying to be on the things of God, and then the other part of your mind is on carnal things or the things that you have put your mind on. And so that man can't receive anything from the Lord. So you shouldn't think you're going to operate in the supernatural with that type of mind. And there are a lot of people, they're one way one day, and then they're another way the, another, uh, the next day, and they think that God is going to do all this amazing stuff through them. It doesn't work like that. God is looking for consistency. Sound-minded people that are not vacillating or unstable, but there is consistency in the life. How many know believers got to have consistency? Amen. Amen. You, you can't keep on 
um, shifting up and changing up on people. That, that, that double-mindedness is not the characteristic of Christ. That's why the Bible says, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Amen. So we're talking about this mind part. It is necessary that the unity of the mind, that you get your mind. See, you can't get on one accord with God's people if you can't get on one accord with yourself. And a double-minded person that is unstable in all their ways, they can't get in agreement with themselves. And so how are you going to get in agreement with what God desires to do and with God's people when you can't even get in agreement with yourself? So that person is unstable in all his way, and he shouldn't think that he'll receive anything from the Lord. So it doesn't matter how much you think you're entitled to something. If you're this person, James said you're not going to receive anything. So that's a good possibility. A lot of people say, I prayed and I ain't getting nothing. I did this and I didn't get anything. Well, he said that double-minded person, that Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, is not going to get anything from the Lord. God is looking for a sound mind. It got quiet in here, but that's okay. All right. So go over to 1 Peter. Chapter 1, verse 13. You ever met people like that? Got that, that double-minded, and then you call them to the carpet, and then they say, well, God's still working on me. Baby, God built the whole world in six days. That's right. That's right. Six yeah. days, God built the, he built the whole earth, That's and then right. the Bible said on the seventh day, he rested. Not because he was tired, but because he was finished. Yeah. So you're going to tell me God built the whole earth in six days, and he been working on you for 60 years. Something is wrong when it takes longer for God to get you right than it did for him to build the earth. He done hung the stars and put the sky back in place and the seas and all the animals and everything in six days. And here you are talking about with the Lord, he's still working on me. The Lord, listen, the Lord don't work on us. You know, we heard that for years. The Lord working, the Lord, the Bible say the Lord work in you both to will and to do his good plan. It didn't say he work on you. Yeah. See, what we call God working on us is our refusal to release what's holding us. Yeah. Yeah. Right. He going to take these cigarettes? We, no, no, he not. No, he not. He not going to take them. He waiting on you to give up some stuff. That double-mindedness will keep you from operating in the supernatural. How are you going to be operating the supernatural and your mind mess up? How? Tell me how. I'm a, yeah, I'm a friend of operating the supernatural. Your mind messed up. Okay, let me read this right here. First Peter 1 Peter 1.13 says, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He said, gird up the loins of your mind. Now, in Ephesians chapter 6, he said, your loins gird about with truth, meaning that you got to put, put a belt of truth around you to tighten up your, your weaponry because your weapons can't be flopping all over the place. So tighten it up yeah. so they'll stay in position. Yeah. Now he's saying over here, Peter is saying, you got to gird up the loins of your mind, meaning that you have to put a band around your mind to keep your thought life intact. Yeah. Yeah. Because, see, the believer is not defeated on the battlefield. The believer is defeated in his mind. That's right. That's right. Yeah. I'm going to get out here and whoop this devil. No, you're not, because you don't get whooped before you get out there. Your mind has whooped you. And so he is telling us something very key, that we are to gird up the loins of our mind. Put a band around your mind so it won't be floating all over the place. Get your mind intact. Then he says, be sober. Don't let what's going on in this world and in your life get you drunk. Don't become intoxicated by life. He said, be sober. But I can't be sober if I don't deal with my mind. Let me ask you a question. I know none of y'all never turn up in the world. Y'all ain't get, you know, I know no, y'all ain't turn up. Some of you might still be turning up, but, but 
<laughs> but, but you know what? When I got turned up in the world, what got affected was my mind. It, listen, you're not turning up talking about your leg felt it. No, when you, when you get drunk, it, it affects your mind. That's why people make decisions under the influence that they wouldn't normally make. Because intoxication affects the mind. He is saying, gird up the loins of your mind and be sober. Why? Because everything that you do is going to be based on your mind. Either your sobriety or your drunkenness. And we're not just talking about some booms farm. We're talking about drunk with whatever. Because you don't have to drink anything to be drunk. You don't have to leave your house to get drunk. Your family calling you with all that drama will make you drunk. You turn on the news and see all the bad stuff. He got shot over there. She got shot over there. It'll make you drunk. And so he has given us the solution that we are to gird up the loins of our mind and that we are to be sober and rest our hope fully on the grace that is to be brought to us through revelation. We started this teaching out by saying that you, you step into the supernatural by revelation. It's not natural knowledge. It's a revelation. And now he is saying that we got to gird up our mind. That means that your mind got to be tight before you can begin to understand what God is trying to reveal to you. You can't, listen, some people just all over the place. They just, they mind everywhere. You try to talk to them, you can hear it in their conversation. Yeah, the, the, the babies, them 50-year-old people, them not no babies. Them grown folk. My babies is this, and, and, and the job is this, and this, my family is this. That, that show you they drunk. Yeah. And if you stay there listening, you're going to get drunk. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. yeah. Yeah. You know, they, they had this saying, you know, friends don't let friends get drunk and drive. But that type of drunkenness, I'm going to let you drive because I'm going to dismiss myself. Yeah. I don't want to be a part of it. So one of the things that I had to learn early on in my Christian walk before I became a pastor is to make sure that my, my thought life is tight and I can't have my thoughts all over the place because you're going to be ineffective. You're going to be trying to pray and your mind going to be scattered. You're going to try to get down to get in the word and your mind all over the place. And you're going to find out even though you were busy, you were not productive because it is impossible to be productive with a scattered mind. Anybody that accomplishes anything know that one of the first things is you got to bring your mind into focus. You got to bring your mind into focus. And if you don't, you're not going to accomplish anything. I mean, I'm praying. Let me see what they're posting on Facebook. I'm praying. I wonder what my grandbaby's doing. Let me call over there and check up. Your mind. You, you haven't put a you hadn't put a, a a gird around your mind, your mind everywhere. And then you you thinking you did something. Baby, as distracted as you were. You might as well went downstairs and ate a grilled cheese sandwich because you didn't accomplish anything. You didn't accomplish nothing. Your your scattered mind. We get we in the supernatural, but this is practical. Where is your mind at? Okay, I can't stay there. Well, yeah, I know I'm in the Word. We're not saying you're not in the Word, but you ain't comprehending it because you're jumping up every five minutes checking something. I thought I had a text come through. Who cares? You're trying to get, get somewhere in God. Who care about a text? That's right. I'm trying to go to the next point. See, this behavior begins to expose priorities. Our, our inability to tune the world out and everything that's going on, it exposes that God is not really the priority. His power is a desire, but his presence is not a priority. Because we will not shut the noise out long enough to be with him to see what heaven is trying to say. 
and what heaven is trying to reveal. I go to church. Church is good, but that's not it, baby. The Bible says Jesus would get up a great while before morning and go up in the mountain to pray, to be with God before the noise got started. The disciples say, teach us to pray. And he began to teach them to pray because they knew there is something that is connected to your power. Where is your power source? Because you don't raise the dead and, and heal and do the stuff you do without a power source. Yeah. So what's the secret to your power? Yeah. And he began to teach them how to pray. But you can't be distracted and think you're going to move in the supernatural. You can't even be a good Christian. Distracted. You ever been talking to somebody? We're going to move on. And you know you was talking to them, but they were distracted. They weren't paying you any attention. That's how, that's how you are with God. He's trying to get, you, get your attention. You, you're distracted. You, all, all over the place. You're distracted. And then you're wondering why. I don't feel like I'm progressing in my relationship. You're not. How? You missed the instruction. What's the title of this message? How are we going to get to the super if we don't get the natural right? You know, when, when, uh, when, when we used to take the, uh, our sons to McDonald's when they were little, and they say, do you want small, medium, or large? Or super size? You, you don't jump the super size. You start out small. I don't care what they say. No, you a child. You getting a small fry with that Happy Meal. We're not supersizing you. When you can grow up and pay for that, you can, you can supersize all you. It's a, listen, it's a price. Anything got super on it, it's a price. Right? Y'all miss that. Y'all miss that. Nothing super comes free. Superman, he had to hide his identity. It was a price. He was anointed, but he had to hide who he really was. In, anything with super is a price. And we're talking about living in the supernatural. We, we failing in the natural. Super implies there is a great price to be paid for this. Okay, let's, let's get into my next point. Faith gives us access to the supernatural. Now, I didn't say it gives you the supernatural. I said it gives you access to the supernatural. All right? Go over to Mark chapter 16. I got faith. You have access. But what do you do with access? Let, let me say this. Just because one has access does not mean that they're utilizing it and taking advantage of it. Y'all understand that, right? Yeah. Over the years, I have given certain people access to my life. I say, you have access. If you, if you desire, I will mentor you. I will mentor you. I, I will train you, right? You have access. They never utilize it. Because they desire something else greater than the impartation that was available to them. And so just because you have access to something does not mean that you are taking advantage of it. Right? And we got to stop thinking because we have access that we're in it and we're mastering it. No, access is just an invitation. It's just an invitation. What do you do with your invitation? Faith gives us access to the supernatural, but that doesn't mean that we're going to take that access and we're going to press into it the way that we need to press into it. All right, y'all over there in Mark 16, 17? This is what Jesus said. And these signs will follow those who what? Believe. Believe. Stop right there. What is the prerequisite for the signs to follow you? Believe. believe. We know that faith is pistis. This word believe is pistoia, and it means un, un, undeniable or unwavering belief. So it's not like I casually believe that these signs will follow me? No, that's, it's unwavering. 
You don't waver in this. This is something that you have to be uh, solidified in. Right. has to be concrete that these signs will follow me because I am a believer. Right. Most people can't say that uh, without any doubt or, or trepidation because they're, they're not totally in faith. They're not totally in belief. They may be in mental assent. And true faith has nothing to do with my mind. Faith is not in your head. That's mental assent. Faith is in your heart. People are like, I believe. You believe because you're thinking on it. You say you believe. That's not belief. Belief is in your heart. So he said these signs, the Greek word for signs is simeons, signatures. Anybody ever wrote a check? In order for that check to go through, it has to have a what? He said these signs, signatures, will follow those who believe. I will sign off on what you do if you believe it. But if you do not believe it, there is no signature on your gift check. I prayed for them, nothing to happen. I did nothing to happen. Well, it didn't have any signs. It didn't have any signatures on it because you didn't believe. You had mental assent, but you didn't believe. Paul said, we have believed, therefore have we spoken. So Jesus said, I'll sign off on these things if you believe. Right? These signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And Now, they ain't talking about the people up in the mountain dancing with the rattlesnakes. You do know there is a a group of people that their services include rattlesnakes. And they're dancing and and praising with rattlesnakes, and and the leader got bit right there on the juggler. And they made him go to the hospital. He was going to die. He came back and was dancing again. This time he didn't make it. He got hit because they say if if you don't get bit, that means you're holy. So Jesus is not telling the church to go play with snakes. He is talking about the demonic realm, the snakes, the devil, his demons, snakes. Okay. You will take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it will not... It will by no means hurt them, and they will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. So these signs will follow us. But the Bible says, do not put the Lord thy God to a foolish test. We don't go play with snakes. And talking about the Lord, say, I can take up snakes. That ain't the snake. Take up the real snake. He's talking about the the enemy, the devil and demons. And he's not talking about going home and getting some Drano and drinking it and say no deadly thing. He's talking about if somebody tried to poison you and you're not aware of it. You will have divine protection and immunity. (laughs) So the way that I get these things to follow me is I got to believe. These signs will follow them, not who have perfect attendance in church. Come to church is good. Not who can sing the best. Singing is good. Who the biggest giver. That, that's not the prerequisite. The prerequisite, these signs will follow those who believe. If you believe it, I'll sign off on it. I'll sign off on it. And, and these things that I'm discussing, you will not be running to it. You will do it. See, the church got fascinated by people that operated in the giftings because we refused to press in to the level of faith that we needed to so we can do it. We got, we, got, we got comfortable watching it, but never walking it out. He didn't say big name preachers. He said, if you believe. So the prerequisite is belief. But it is hard to believe if you are a double-minded person. Oh, God. Okay. There, there are two things. Oh. Let, let me, let me, because I got the definition. It just, it's hit me. I was like, why am I thinking about this right here? So there are two things. Uh, one of them is, let's see. 
One of them is unbelief, and one of them is disbelief. Unbelief means that you cannot be convinced that it's real or that it can happen. That's unbelief. Like, Jesus couldn't do many miracles there because of their what? So there are a lot of people sitting in church that has unbelief. They, they, don't, they just don't believe it. And so unbelief is skepticism, especially in matters of religious faith. So you're skeptical. I, I don't believe that, right? So disbelief is the act of disbelieving. It means mental rejection of something as untrue. So you have people that are in unbelief, then you have people that are in disbelief. Either one of them is bad. E either one of them is, is bad. You will not walk out and you will not receive everything that God desires for you to receive. So you got to make sure as a believer that you're not operating in any one of these, right? So these signs will follow them that believe. Let's, let's just realize this is the, the, the foundation. Get your belief right. Just like Hebrews says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things what? It's, it's the foundation. If you don't have the foundation right, nothing else is going to work. It's the foundation. Your belief system got to be intact. And it, it, it's not. See, we, we, when we, everything is going our way, I believe. He is a provider. I believe. Well, the Bible says in James that the trying of your faith work of patience. But you got to let patience have her perfect work in you so you can be perfect and entire like in nothing. So patience have a work to do. But patience only hits the clock after trials have shown up. <sighs> See, once the trial is in operation, faith clocks in. Patience clock in. Patience is there to do some work in you. You don't develop in patience and faith without trials. People are like, I want to be strong in my faith. Okay? Because we got one part of it, right? Faith comes by hearing. and hearing by the word of God. That's how you receive faith. It has been given to every man has been dealt the measure, measure of faith. We all having the same spirit. spirit of faith. Okay, so we understand faith comes by hearing. That's how it comes. How is it developed? Patience. Why do I need patience? Because I'm in a trial. Yes. See, without trials, patience wouldn't be developed, yes. and you would never uh, experience your faith swelling. Yes. Faith is a muscle. It only swells with resistance. That's why I say it's the trying of your faith, not your salvation. The trying of your faith work of your faith has to go on trial. You, you don't even know what you have if it has not come up against anything. Faith is not developed in bright places. It is developed like a photo in a dark room. You, you don't develop photos in light places. You go in a dark room. That's how faith is. Faith is developed in dark seasons. It's not developed when everything is going great in your life. And we, we like, I hear the word, I got faith. You have it. But is it, is it that infant faith? Because you know there, there's infant faith, there's little faith, and then there's great faith. So you may have it, but it may still be in that infant stage. Because you never allowed your faith to encounter resistance right. They came and you ran instead of dealing with it. Because it is the dealing with it that develops the faith. Not sitting waiting for the storm to blow over. Y'all getting this right. I, I want to be a great woman of God and of faith. 
Well, you're going to have to take them pull-ups off and put on your big man and big woman yeah. undergarment yeah. and fight. Yeah. You're not going to develop running. But why I got to go through that? Because you say you want to operate in supernatural. Oh, man, 30 minutes in. Do, do you realize the supernatural not for wimp? See, this is the thing, Sister Dorothy. We accidentally bump into the anointing. You don't get into the supernatural accidentally. That is a strategic place. Oh, I can't go there right now. I'm, I'm trying to get there, though, before we leave tonight. Okay, so go to Romans 4.17. I want to get to the difference between the anointing and the glory, but I don't know if I'm going to get there tonight. Romans 4, 17, are you there? As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him who, of him whom he believed, God, who gives life to the dead and call those things which do not exist as though they did. Verse 18 who contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of nations, according to what was spoken. According to what? So shall your descendants be, verse 19. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Verse 20, he did not waver, say he did not waver, at the promises of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was able to perform. Abraham believed God. Even in the midst of, it looked like an impossible situation, it say he did not stagger in unbelief. Why is he the father of faith? Because he did not let what he see detour him from what God said. He didn't stagger at the promises of God, even though he was almost 100. Sarah's womb is dead, but God said you're going to have a a child, a son. That was supernatural, y'all, for a couple that should have been in a nursing home. Y'all... It said he was almost what? A hundred. And Sarah ain't far behind. That, this is supernatural. He did not stagger. He didn't say, oh, I'm too old. He didn't say, where the vag right? He said, he is faithful. Who promised? Y'all, they didn't have no Viagra. He trusted God. Why? Because faith gives us access into the supernatural. It was his faith, his unwavering faith. He didn't stagger like a drunk man at the promises of God, meaning that he was sober. And he believed that God, because he promised it, he would bring it to pass. Y'all, Abraham, he deserves to be right here because I don't know if I could be right here. I don't know if I could be right there in the book of the Hall of Faith. And Father Abraham staggered not. When when he told some of y'all to take your only child up that mountain, you would have been like, Lord, I love you. Please don't send me to hell. But me and my child going back to the tent. Y'all know y'all. And some of you might say, just send me to hell, but don't touch my child. I know you're saying, oh, no, don't don't even don't even answer that because you've never been put in that predicament. God said, your only son, who you love, who you love. Notice he said, who you love. And notice he said, only, because Ishmael wasn't even considered his son to God. He didn't even consider Ishmael his son. He said, your only son, because this is the son of promise. See, stuff you birth out of disobedience, God don't call it here. He called it this right here, the covenant. Your only son, okay. Who you love. Kill him. 
Because his y'all be like, he was going to kill his son. He was going to do more than kill him. He was going to put that knife through his heart. He was going to take that torch, light that wood. He was supposed to be a burnt offering. Not just, see, he, see forget the death. You got to be dead to be burned. He was going to be a burnt offering. So the first part of that was to kill him. The next part was to burn him up as a burnt offering. So Abram did not stagger. He said, if God promised it, he'll not only put the ashes back together. See, y'all don't know how awesome God is. You don't even know the type of faith that Abraham had. He was believing that God would put them ashes back together, recreate his son, and then breathe life back into him. That's more than just raising from the dead. No, the ashes. Because Isaac say, I see the fire. I see the wood going up there. He said, where the sacrifice at? He had sacrificed with his daddy for years. He knew you don't go to worship without a sacrifice. And Abraham said, God will provide himself a sacrifice. Not for himself. Himself. Do you have a faith like that? Because I'm telling you, if you if you're just operating in cute faith, where heaven never puts a demand on it, where heaven does not give you in, you know, illogical instructions, stuff that doesn't make sense to your natural mind, yeah. you, you're not going to have that kind of faith. When heaven asks you for something that you know yeah. in the natural, I can't release this. The supernatural is accessed by faith. Hebrews 11 and 3. Because we like it cute. It's cute. It's comfortable. You know, the church paid off and, oh, man, we got projects done and we're just chilling right now. No, you can't never chill. No, A faith, uh, listen to how I say this. A faith that does not have a challenge is unnecessary. If you, if you got your faith to a place and you never still have challenges for that faith to overcome, then it's unnecessary for you to have faith. Faith always has a goal. Faith always has a target. There is no chill season in faith. Okay. Hebrews 11 and 3. By faith, we understand that the worlds, plural, were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. It takes faith to believe that the worlds were framed by the word of God. See, God didn't hire a construction company. He spoke. They were framed by the word of God. Everything that we see came into existence by the word of God. It takes faith to believe that. Now, I don't think it takes more faith to believe that than to believe everything else just appeared. I think it takes more faith to be an atheist than a believer. Because I have a hard time trying to say this just magically appeared without a divine creator. Uh, it had, you, you see, atheists got more faith than the Christians. Because you got to have a lot of faith to believe all this just happened. <laughs> but it says, by faith we believe that the things that we can see were not made by things you can see, but were made by the word of God. The word of God is a creative force. Yes, yes. And we're speaking spirits. We're supposed to be creating, but you can't create if your faith is not right. We just speaking stuff just to hear ourselves talk. If it's not coming from a place of faith, keep it under wraps. I'm going to speak it out there in the universe. It's going to fall to the ground. Because Paul says we have believed the past sense. Therefore, hell, we spoken. We didn't speak until we believed. We're not out here just speaking stuff and don't believe it. got my confessions every morning. Stop confessing until you believe. That's right. That's right. 
I'm going to say it till I believe it. That ain't how it works. You believe it, then you say it. Y'all, y'all with me? Y'all, y'all act like you're struggling with this. You're struggling with it. This, see, this is not for the, the, the infants. This is for the mature. Those that are on the meat of the word. See, those that's on the milk, they just want to hear they're going to get their stuff. And it's their breakthrough harvest season. No, this is for those that are on the meat of the word. Because this right here puts the responsibility back on us. See, infants don't take responsibility. They just suck, sleep, and boo-boo. That's an infant, right? But an adult. And it gets a little tight when, you, when you're sharing mature stuff. Because, see, we think this stuff magic. We just like, oh, that just happens. No, it don't just happen. This ain't no magic. This is intentional. Lord, help me up in here. Mark eleven twenty three. Am I helping you? Do you believe Abraham had a supernatural life? Don't, don't, don't you see that was supernatural? I mean, they just got resurrected. Abram went in that tent. Sarah didn't look the same. She was already beautiful. You know, that's why the king wanted her, because she was so beautiful. That was some beautiful women. Isaac went through the same thing. They wanted his wife. There were no ugly women. But see, you can be beautiful and, and, and not functioning. Uh, looks don't mean nothing if it ain't nothing inside. And you can be a beautiful fool or a beautiful mess. It don't mean nothing if you can't produce. But once God breathed on it, Abram said, like, he's like, I'm a producer. I'm a producer. She conceived. I bet that was a sight. Seventy-something-year-old woman Carrying that baby, I bet that was something. <laughs> Abraham going to the um, PTA meetings, that's your grandson? No, this is my son. What you mean, my grandson? This, this is my boy. <laughs> Sarah at the park with the other mother, is that your grand grandson? No, this is my baby. <laughs> Yo, what? <laughs> that was a miracle. That was supernatural because he didn't stagger. The Bible says he didn't even consider the deadness of Sarah's womb. Because, see, we always say them old people, Abraham was functioning. That's how Hagar got pregnant. Hagar got pregnant, remember? Abraham said, I'm functioning. It might be some snow on the chimney, but it's still some fire in the, in the fireplace. And you know... So, it, <laughs> it was the dead. It was the deadness of her birthing place. Can you put that in your next book right there <laughs> on prayer? The deadness of her birthing place. Cause see, the the place that's supposed to be giving birth and life coming, it can be dead sometimes. And so once she had Isaac, boy, that was the promise. Laughter right there. They laughing. But Sarah died. And some of y'all would say, well, Abram, go ahead and mourn. And, you know, Abram say, no, who is that fine-looking lady right there? They say, oh, that's Keturah. He say, he say tell her to come here. Oh, y'all know your Bible. Yeah, that's word. Is that not the Bible? Well, it might not be exactly like I'm saying it, but come on, I'm paraphrasing. Y'all got to make the Bible fun. Yeah. You know? I don't know how y'all ain't right. Y'all ain't ready. <laughs> he got couture. I mean, say, what's up, couture? You know. <laughs> he say, what's up with you? <laughs> wow. I need some people I can have fun with. <laughs> Y'all boring. He said, I seen you at the Camel Mall. <laughs> 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 
I'm going to save you the story. But him, him and Keturah end up getting married, right? He hooked her. I don't know what lines he used, but he hooked her. And he had, what, three more sons? Or five, three? How I many? Three? three? Three sons by Keturah. Abraham was, he was a producer. Yeah. Yeah. I'm seeing something in this. I'm trying to get to this. Once you have, have mastered something in faith, you never should go back. Once faith produces here, it should produce over here. So, so once you have used your faith to accomplish something, it should be a life of faith. You shouldn't have to keep going back. Yeah. Abram didn't have to go get a touch no more. He was touched. How many understand that? You ain't got to keep going back to the beginning of faith school. You go from faith to So that means that faith has points. So I don't go back. I go from this point of faith to that point of faith. I go from faith to faith and glory to glory. I don't diminish. I keep going forth. Okay, y'all in Mark 11.23, I got it. Y'all want me to talk about Couture. I'll tell you that story another time. 11.23. Listen to what Jesus said. He says, and whenever you stand praying, not if you pray. You should, I mean, no, you should pray. He's saying, whenever you stand praying, oh, Lord, you started me at the, at the bottom. I'm not going to argue with you, Lord, because I know what my... My notes say 23, but you put me right here in 25, okay? And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him. That your Father in heaven may also forgive you of your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, if you do not what? Forgive. Forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you your trespasses. Forgiveness is a seed that is necessary for you to be released. If you do not give, extend the seed of forgiveness, then that harvest of forgiveness does not hit your life. Now, that's where he had me to start. But my scripture where I wanted to start is right here in verse 22. So Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. Verse 23. For surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, mountain is an impossible situation. Okay. Say an impossible situation. impossible situation. Be removed and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart. We started out talking about these signs will follow them that believe. Now Jesus saying, if you don't doubt in your heart. So the heart is the place of Belief, but believes that those things which he says will be done. He will have whatsoever he prays. He will have those things he says will be done. He will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you have received them and you will have them. Say to this mountain, be removed. But notice what he said. He said, whatsoever things you say. Right. So the miracle is not happening in the praying. How can I communicate this? Okay. Let me, thank you, Holy Ghost. Okay. This, this is me, right? I mean, it's not me. Hypothetically, this is me, okay? Because somebody, that ain't you. Yeah. Y'all going to leave me alone tonight. Okay, so when I'm praying, something is going on in me. Right? You see that whirlwind? But when I'm saying, something is going on out here. The praying is not for the atmosphere. The praying is for this, for me. The saying is for the atmosphere. Because he dealt with whatever you say. You, see, you don't pray the mountains. You say the mountains. So the shift happens in the saying. But the change happens in the praying. In me. So I'm praying to have the capacity. 
So the praying is not for heaven and it's not for earth. The praying is for me. The saying is for earth and the atmosphere. Because he said, whatever you say. So, because we pray one thing and then we say something else. We pray I'm the healed of the Lord. By his stripes I'm healed. He sent his word and healed all their diseases. We, we, we say that. Then we say, oh, my back killing me. Okay, let, let's stop right here. Okay, you pray right, but you said wrong. Your saying got to be in agreement with your praying. And your praying has to be based on the word of God. We don't pray one thing and get out here and say something else. The Bible says in, in, in Job, we can decree a thing and it shall be established. Well, we can't make up stuff. We have to decree what he already said. But I, it doesn't matter how many hours you lay before the Lord and prostrate before Jesus and he came and you grabbed the hem of his garment and you got up glowing. That don't even matter. What do you say when you get up off that carpet? Yes. When your coworker do something to you and you've been praying that you're meek and you're humble and your temper under control. And then when your coworker do something to you, and then DMX start running through your mind, y'all gonna make me lose my mind up in here. Y'all, y'all. You, you, you're not supposed to do it. They doing it. They doing it. They, I know they doing it. I'm their pastor. I know. And they ain't delivered yet. They ain't delivered yet. I know. I'm they, I watch for their soul, and they soul struggling right now. That, oh, we supposed to get up and say what we've been praying. Not this helper don't know me. Well, you know what? Okay. You said that. You said that. Don't even say nothing. You said it. I know you said it. You said it. Tell me you didn't say it. Now, I need all three of y'all that said that, to be honest with me. Look at that. Three hands. Four. I got a bonus. You say, I know you said it. I heard you say it. Now, listen. Now, who, who are you? Because the old me dead. What's your song, Maurice? The old me dead. He ain't never coming back. That's the song, right? Okay, so if you say that heifer don't know me, that implies you ain't dead. That old you still there. When you say they don't know me, that means there's some stuff behind me. That means that ain't the crucified you. That's right. That's the hell is you. Now, you don't pray for God to help you crucify your flesh and you crying and like, I don't want to go back to that person I used to be. And then you say, that heifer don't know me. Listen, that heifer didn't resurrect you. You did. Uh, Trials can't resurrect you. You make a decision to step out of that coffin. Think, think about what we're saying. Think about what we're saying. We're praying something, but then we like, oh, he don't know me. He can catch these hands. Okay. Hold on. Let, let's be real. So are you the brother or are you still a thug? Ah! Uh, uh, who are you? Yeah. We're supposed to be in Christ. Christ ain't throwing no hands. Excuse my vernacular, but Christ not throwing no hands. Come on. Come on. Go ahead. When you tell a person, somebody, oh, they can catch these hands, you're not dead. You're talking about the supernatural. You're still working on deliverance. Yeah, that's right. They don't know me. 
That's that, something wrong with that because the life of Christ should be shining through you. They should know you. Come on. Amen. 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 Y'all, y'all, uh, I'm not going to get no love tonight. <laughs> what are you saying, Cree Cree? We saying it's still a fool in him. So that fool has more control than the Holy Ghost. You're not delivered. Let's take that super off and put living in the natural. Because I'm trying to prepare you for greater. But I can't prepare you for greater if you keep on going in there having a seance. Talking to dead people. Who you? I ain't talking. You talking to yourself. Yeah. Your old self supposed to be dead. Why you keep resurrecting them? Why you practicing necromancy? I can't get you in the supernatural when you still battling these little, uh, little imps and these little things you supposed to be done overcame. We come in here shouting, we all, the Lord is good. When did the change happen? Water freezes at 32. It boils at what, 111, 212? Steam comes off in the middle between the 32 and the 212, there's steam. Because we have ice, we have steam, we have boiling. 212 is the place of change. 32 is the place of change. When do we change? When do we stop getting information and start transformation? When do we stop talking about priest, pastor, and still got hell in you? Your heart's still bitter. You still ready to go snatch people up. When, when does change take place? Because in order to get the 212, the heat has to be turned up. You can't handle being turned up. I'm trying. Apostle, when we going to have a class on, we teach us the practical suit. No, I'm trying to teach you how to get delivered. I'm trying to teach you how to die to self so you can talk about they do know me because I'm a child of God. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing how we can lie to ourselves and tell ourselves we're going to be something great when we will not deal with the stuff that's keeping us from being who God wants us to be. Do you realize greatness comes after secured identity? Yeah. I need a toy mic to drop it. So say, you got a toy mic for me. You ain't got no toy mic, baby. You ain't got your tambourine. You ain't got nothing I can drop. You got a tambourine. Can I drop it? I'll buy you another one. I just need to drop something right now. Oh, God, I'm going to drop it. Mr. Wright, I cash out you. I get another one. So, come on. That's a look. That's a look. Okay, that's good. It looked like a mic, too. What did I say about your identity? Greatness comes after you secure what? Some of you trying to be great and your identity jacked up. Y'all remember, some of y'all might be too young, but y'all remember when we had the black and white TV with the uh, yeah. aluminum foil on the antenna? Right. And, and, and you remember when sometimes you would see two different stations bleeding in, yeah. and you'd be trying to get that thing turned to focus on that one station you want to see, but sometimes two stations be fighting. Yeah. Yeah. Just like with your radio, back when we had to turn our radio. Remember, yeah. and you're trying to tune in to one frequency and another. So yeah. you're trying to listen back in the day. It was your R&B and then country. And all the girls, I love you. Like, I ain't trying to hear that. I'm trying to hear this right here. But it was, it was like a fight, right? Two, yeah. two different things competing. Yeah. That's how it is with, with a lot of belief. See, see, the old you is trying to take the stage, and the new you trying to take the stage, and it, it's bleeding in, and it's blurred, and it's a battle going on. And you're trying to be great, 
without securing your identity. You, oh, it's 8 o'clock. Oh, God. You, you got to secure your identity in him before you start operating in the supernatural. Praise the Lord. I, I pray you will bless. Come on, you can give him some praise. Come on. He's worthy. Amen. Amen. Where's well, kingdom investment time? Amen. If you need envelope, raise your hand. Million is M I L L I O N. Amen. I know I walked heavy tonight, but it's okay. It, it, listen, it wasn't, my, it, it wasn't my intention, you know, but it was his intention because he got to get y'all delivered. You know, sometimes if we just think before we say stuff and before we do stuff, it'll save us a whole lot of repentance we got to go do because it's hard to progress when you're stuck at repenting. When your prayer life consists of, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said it, but they just made me so mad. It's hard to progress when your prayer life is basically repenting from all the stuff you should have been delivered from. Right? We should be able to come boldly before the throne of grace with confidence, but you can't have confidence when you know So the church not progressing, we repenting because we won't get delivered. Oh, man, this reality of hell. Oh, my goodness. Whew. When you're ready, you can sing. Hell is real. I know the cute church doesn't act like it don't exist. Hell is real. And matter of fact, it's a renovation project going on. It says hell has enlarged. It's ghosts. I mean, it wasn't big enough because hell was intended for the devil and his fallen angels. It wasn't intended for people, but so many people going to hell. This is a hard saying, but it's true. There's more people going to hell than heaven. Jesus said, narrow is the way that leads to life. Wide is the way that leads to destruction, and many go thereof. I mean, there are more people going to hell than heaven. And that's sad, because it was only built for the devil and his, his angels. But how many people are following him into it? Come on, hold it up. Father, we thank you once again. You give seed to the sower, bread to the eater. Thank you that as long as the earth remains, there will be seed time and harvest. Thank you that you take pleasure in our prosperity, because we favor your righteous cause. So tonight we return the tithe, giving an offering, so a seed. Thank you that it's blessed and multiplied for the upbuilding of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.